And I'm happy to announce for another year in a row, the tomb is still empty. <laughs> All right. Happy Easter, everybody. Great to see you on this great resurrection celebration. Our text this morning in the Bible is not going to be perhaps uh, what we would call the normal or usual text. We're going to look in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. You'll find the book of Ephesians a little better than halfway through your New Testament. And I think it's an appropriate question these days, what's Easter all about? Well, I want to begin to answer that question with a question. What would you like to change about yourself? Maybe you want to be more confident, more relaxed, more outgoing, less fearful, maybe less bitter or angry. The fact of the matter is that most people want to change something about themselves. We recognize that we're not perfect. Well, at least you aren't. <laughs> we recognize that there are some things about us that could use improvement, right? And so we have all sorts of seminars and self-help books and you name it. And people flock to the seminars and they buy the self-help books. But here's the problem. Most people want a quick and painless change. And it doesn't happen that way. And so they end up quitting. And to prove that point, I want you to look back just a few weeks ago to your New Year's resolutions. <laughs> I won't ask how many are still following them. <laughs> and so what happens? We quit. We quit. And the problem with many of these seminars, many of these books, is that they identify the what without giving us the how. You need to be more confident. How? Well, we're not going to tell you that. We don't know. <laughs> right? You need to be more outgoing. How? And without the how, it lacks power. It lacks power. And so here's the good news. That's what Easter's all about. I want to preach to you today, as you see up on the monitors, Easter has the power to change your life. Because <clears throat> Jesus is alive, we can live too. And because <clears throat> the tomb is still empty, our lives can be full. Jesus said, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly, overflowing life. Too many people are merely existing and don't understand what real living is all about. Too many people are saying that what they're doing is real living when the fact of the matter is it isn't because it's not grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said real living is in me. Is in me. I came to give it to you. <clears throat> so I want to read to you beginning here in Ephesians 1 and read with you beginning in verse 13. I want you to know that just these few verses we're going to read together, there's a ton here to unpack. I can get about five dozen sermons, at least, out of this. So buckle up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we will focus our attention. In verse 13, it says, In Christ you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore I also, this is the Apostle Paul, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, now notice what he prays, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, 
what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You get the impression that Jesus is something special? He was someone big and is someone big? Man, I'll tell you what. This, this Easter Sunday, uh, uh, Lynn and I were talking yesterday, it's, it's interesting to me, and it bothers me a little bit, but... Um, Easter is kind of the secondary holiday, isn't it? I mean, Christmas is big, it's huge. And you need Christmas if you're going to have Easter, obviously, right? The birth of Christ had to precede the death and resurrection of Jesus, but it's the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ where the power is. This is the holiday. And that's why we meet on Sundays, by the way. That's why the early church began meeting on Sundays. It was Resurrection Day. Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says here, my prayer is this. And and I want to focus just on the third part of that prayer. He says, my prayer for those of us who believe is that you would grasp the exceeding greatness of God's power to us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Wow. Wow. And I love where it says exceeding greatness of His power. That's like the greatness, greatness of His power, right? That's that's like the incredible greatness of the power of God. You realize that the God we serve, if you know Christ as your personal Savior, the God who calls us His children is the God who is all-powerful. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. I have up here a verse from another letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians. The church at Philippi, chapter 3 and verse 10. And he says this, It was his great desire that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. This word power that we're talking about today is the Greek word dunamis, which is where we get the English word dynamite. That's powerful stuff. Do you ever witness I've never seen it in person, but I love watching videos of dynamite going off. I'm a guy. What can I say? (laughs) Explosions, you know. Dynamite has the power to move, the power to change, the power to rearrange. But unlike the destructive power of dynamite, the power of God restores rather than wrecks. And when we let Jesus Christ into our lives, and we let God through His Word start moving in us, because really, when you tr- he, we read this, when you trust Jesus as your personal Savior, God gives us the Holy Spirit dwelling within us as the down payment of the inheritance we're going to get. Someday, a down payment. The Holy Spirit of God living within us. Man, I'm telling you, where where are you going to get more power than that? So what is this resurrection power, and how can it change your life? Well, first of all, it's this. Resurrection power is the power to cancel your past. That's good news. (laughs) <laughs> that is really good news. I'm not talking about denying that it ever happened. 
I'm not talking about redefining things so that what once was called wrong is now okay. It's now called right. Therefore, I, I don't have to feel any guilt. By the way, it doesn't matter how you define anything. It's what God uses on the inside to convict us. Our conscience. The Spirit of God. And there is right from wrong, good from bad. And when we give ourselves over to the Lord, when we receive Jesus as our personal Savior, He, the resurrected Christ, has the power to cancel your past. I want to read to you a couple of other passages to the church at Colossae. Paul wrote this in Colossians 2. You were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. Isn't that cool? That's that resurrection power. Then God made you alive with Christ, for He forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. The Old Testament prophecies... Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus hung on the tree for us. He took our curse upon Him. My God, my God, why have You forsaken me? He cried from the cross. Because for the first time in all of eternity and the only time in all of eternity, the Father had to turn His back on the Son because as the Apostle Paul wrote, He became sin for us even though He knew no sin that we might be made right with God through Him. He took your sins and mine and all that they deserve upon Himself and He suffered it there on the cross. And then God accepted that sacrifice. Once for all, we find written in the book of Hebrews several times, He did it once for all so that our past can be canceled. It means to eliminate, neutralize, expunge. And man, that's important. That's important. This isn't turning over a new leaf. That's not what it's all about. Here's the way the Bible puts it. The Apostle Paul talked about God taking the righteousness of Jesus Christ and imputing it to our account. A banking term where God takes the riches of Christ, the glory of Christ, the the righteousness of Christ, and when we say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell for my sin. I deserve judgment and the penalty for my sin against an all-holy God. But I'm trusting what You did for me on the cross. Come into my life and save me from my sin. When we trust Jesus as our personal Savior, God takes the righteousness of His Son and He places it in our account. So when He looks down at us who have believed, He sees the righteousness of His Son. Thank You, Lord, that You're not looking at my righteousness because there ain't a lot there to be had. Now I look down and I see the righteousness of my Son. And I call You, because of Him, righteous. Oh. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Man, it's the power to cancel your past. Here's what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No penalty for sin Because you're in Christ. When you trust Jesus and ask Him into your life, spiritually, God puts us in Christ, positionally. Which means we're already in the mind of God, seated in the heavenlies. And that's a whole other theological uh, uh, discussion and sermon I'm not going to get into. But God sees us already seated in the heavenlies. Because He is... The God of the past, present, and future, right? (laughs) 
He says, spiritually, we were dead, we were guilty, we were condemned. But in Christ, through the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ, that resurrection power, we're alive. We're forgiven. We're free. By the way, let me just talk to you for one second here about this thing of freedom. There are those today who say, freedom is doing whatever I want. That's real freedom. No, you're a slave to whatever you give yourself over to, the Bible says. And whether it's sin unto death or of righteousness unto life. And the freedom I have by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ is the freedom Not to sin, and and not to give myself over to sin, but the freedom to live for God. And i got to tell you, I've done both. I've been there. I like this side better. This side's a whole lot better. It's not easy, but it's better. Spiritually dead, guilty, condemned, but now alive in Christ. Forgiven, free. One source puts it this way. To enter the presence of a holy God, we must be hidden in the righteousness of Christ. And to be in Christ means that God no longer sees our imperfections. He sees the righteousness of His own Son. Only in Christ is our sin debt canceled our relationship with God restored, and our eternity secured. Now, that's the spiritual end of it, but what about the psychological end of it? I think we all have regrets, failures, mistakes, memories of indiscretions, Things that we did we wish we hadn't done. Things that we saw we wish we hadn't seen. Things that we said we wish we hadn't said. They have hurt us and they have hurt others. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And friends, I'm not saying don't try to go back and and try to make amends if there's somebody you need to ask for forgiveness. Absolutely do that. If you need to render an apology, please, by all means, do that. But we need not beat ourselves up over the past because if God doesn't condemn us, do we have the right to? By the way, if God doesn't condemn us, you and me, in Christ, then I don't have the right to condemn you and vice versa. Right? In Christ, there's the power. There's the power to cancel your past. The resurrection power is also the power to conquer your problems. Anybody here have problems? Oh, just a couple of you. Oh, boy. The rest of you who didn't raise your hand, I want to know your secret. (laughs) Really want to know your secret. Of course, we all have problems. You know when that started? That started in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall of man when God had to curse the ground and curse the, the, the universe actually because of sin. There's been problems ever since. And friends, they don't get any easier and they don't get any better, do they? And God never promised to take the problems away. He promised to give us the power to go through them. He promised to give us the power to overcome them. Listen to this again from Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul writes, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, He says we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. 
More than conquerors. You know, I, I, I got thinking about that. I love that. A conqueror is someone who overcomes by gaining control, right? We are more than conquerors. You know why? Because in Christ, He has all the control. <laughs> what did He say in John 16 and verse 33? Jesus said, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulations. You will have problems. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I'm an overcomer because I'm in Christ and He is the chief overcomer. Now, some people want you to believe that if you receive Jesus into your life, you won't have any more problems. You won't have financial problems. God's just going to dump oodles of money into your bank account. You're not going to have family problems. You're, you're not going to have any problems whatsoever. I don't know what Bible they're reading, but it ain't the Bible. Just read Job, okay? It is not the Word of God. Jesus said, in this world you will have problems. And so what do I need to do? I need to trust Him, the overcomer, because He's overcome the world. You know what our real problem is? Our real problem is what we do with our problems. We worry. We try to solve them. We try to do it all on our own and in our own strength. When the fact of the matter is, God wants us to trust our Savior. You see, He saves us from our sins. He saves us from death, from hell, from... And He also saves us from us. <laughs> That's a good thing sometimes, isn't it? All the time. Absolutely. I heard somebody one time say, uh, if you ask someone how you're doing and they say, pretty good under the circumstances, you need to ask them, what are you doing under there? <laughs> what are you doing under the circumstances? If someone said, uh, circumstances are like a mattress. When you're on top, you rest easy. When you're underneath, you suffocate. <laughs> and we can't let our circumstances dictate and control because the Lord is going to do that. Why do I have problems? Problems have a purpose. Sometimes they're a warning. Sometimes they're discipline. And almost all the time, they're to gain our attention. God. Somebody, said, somebody once said that God whispers to us in our pleasures and yells to us in our problems. Listen to what Job said in Job 36 and verse 15. He said, By means of their suffering, God rescues those who suffer, for He gets their attention through adversity. Have you ever seen somebody and known somebody who when man, all of a sudden, the bottom falls out of life, and then they start talking about God. Never talked about God, didn't want to talk about God, didn't want to hear anything, but man, life just, boom. And oh yeah, maybe I should consider God. Oh, maybe you should. That's a wise choice. And sometimes God will let the bottom of life fall out so that you can look up. So that you can look up. The resurrection power is the power to cancel your past. It's the power to conquer your problems. I want to read to you one more. Um, perhaps you're familiar with Jensen Huang, who is the president of um, oh, NVIDIA. Uh, in his recent remarks, I just read this, in his recent remarks at Stanford, the billionaire co-founder of NVIDIA told students, I hope suffering happens to you. He went on to say that success and resilience require, quote, ample doses of pain. Greatness is not intelligence. 
Greatness comes from character, and character isn't formed out of smart people. It's formed out of people who suffered, unquote. Truth. Truth. And that leads me to the third way that resurrection power can change your life. It's the power to change your personality. Your character. I know this one smarts. We don't like to admit that there might be something wrong with our character, but if you remember, we already did right at the beginning of the sermon, okay? <laughs> Let's face it. I love, you know, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was the, the uh, London's prince of preachers back in the 19th century, and when he was talking about personality flaws and quirks, he said, are we not all a little off the balance? <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we all are. Paul wrote this, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. He's making all things new. And I can tell you, over the past 46 years, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, He is still making all things new in my life and from my life. Like Paul, I'll say I haven't attained yet. I never will until the day I go to face to face. And then the Bible says I will be like Him. But until then, God wants to work out some character flaws. What needs correcting? Well, the first thing is how I think. How I think. I want you to understand that just because you think something doesn't mean it's right. And we all think something. A lot of times. And sometimes our thoughts are our worst enemy. Do you realize that the voice in your head is the voice you hear most every single day? What are you feeding that voice? What are you feeding your mind? Back when computers were starting to make the scene, right? There was, there was the saying, garbage in, garbage out. Right, Rick? Garbage, I think it's still true, isn't it? Okay. Garbage in, garbage out. Feeding our minds. Listen, again, the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 12. Some of you know these verses very, uh, um, uh, you have them memorized. You know them very well. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he'll find acceptable. This is your rational service. And then he says this, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. The renewing of your mind. Then you will learn to know God's will for you and what is that good and pleasing and perfect will of God. By changing the way you think. How do I do that? Well, let me read to you another verse. It's found in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, lovely, of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, think, that is, consider, take into account, weigh, meditate on these things. I want you to understand that the majority of TV shows do not qualify for Philippians 4.8. Just saying. And I dare say that for many who call themselves Christians, who call themselves believers, they're not spending time in that which is holy and right and good and perfect and, and, and lovely and praiseworthy, which is the Word of God who tells us about the glory of God, shows us the things 
in us that need to be changed. It changes our thinking. It changes our thinking. And we need it. What else needs correcting? How I feel. How I feel. You realize today that feelings are everything. How I feel dictates how the world should operate. Doesn't matter if you don't feel the same way, it's how I feel. Right? And we allow our feelings to impact our behavior. And you know and I know that when we do that, more often than not, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. Jesus said this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. A lot of people today living in fear, living with troubled hearts, anxiety and anxiousness, and those feelings of lack of control and so on. Jesus said, let me take care of that. Come unto me, He said. Come to me, all you who are weary and you're overburdened, and I'll give you rest. We need correcting in our thinking, in our feelings, and in our acting, in our behaving. Once again from Romans chapter 8, Paul said, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. Life. That's eternal life. That's the abundant life I talked about earlier. That's a changed life. God will give that to us when we give ourselves to Him. Now I said this one here about uh, changing our our personality, correcting some things, (coughs) might, might hit us a little... Uh, a, a little awkwardly. So I have this, um, I, I call it a my personality is just fine, thank you very much. Items here. Okay? Jesus said, Let the Lord be God with all your heart, with all your soul. He also Others, whatever you would like them. Speaking of no one. (laughs) We just have an invitation right there, right? Speak evil of no one because Jesus has the power to change our lives. Jesus has the power to change your life. And so what do you need His resurrection power for today? Addiction? Attraction? Anxiety? The need to control things? A fractured family? A crumbling marriage? An unforgiving heart? The list is endless, isn't it? The failures stack high, but His power is greater. And His love is stronger. And His forgiveness is available for all. And today on Easter Sunday, I ask, won't you let Him change your life today? If somebody would be saying, Pastor Kurt, today I need the love, the forgiveness, the resurrection power of Jesus. I want to invite Him into my life. If that's your desire and your prayer, I want to lead a word of prayer right now. I ask you to pray it silently. If you've never prayed to ask Christ into your life, this is the time to do it. What, a better day, what better day is there than Easter Sunday than to receive Jesus Christ, the living Son of God? And I'm just going to word a prayer, and you can pray it quietly, silently. God hears your thoughts. He knows. And why not say this today, dear God, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice for me. 
I pray today, dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me. Give me that abundant life and the eternal life that you promised. I'm trusting you and you alone and what you did on the cross for me. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you've prayed that prayer for the first time today, you never prayed that before you received the Lord Jesus today, would you let me know on your way out just so I can rejoice with you and, and uh, just keep you in prayer? Perhaps your prayer today is, uh, Pastor, pray for me because I've been a Christian for many years, but I don't have Jesus' resurrection power controlling my life. My past haunts me. My problems defeat me. And my personality rarely reflects my Savior. And I'd like that to start changing today. Anybody say, Pastor, pray for me? Amen. Amen. Anybody uplifted hand, put it back down? Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Father, you know our hearts. You see our hands. You know those who want to live this resurrected power, resurrection power, Lord, and thank you for it. And I pray that you'd help us to grasp it as Paul prayed. Help us to understand it more fully. And Lord, help us today as we leave here on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday, help us to rejoice in your goodness, your mercy, your love, your grace, and your amazing plan to bring us into fellowship with you through the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.